starting now. Okay. So um, welcome everyone. And my name is Laura Sachs, and I'm going to be your um, host uh, today from the West Kootenai Climate Hub. And uh, before we get started, I wanted to acknowledge with your respect and gratitude that we're on the traditional and unceded territories of the Sinaiqs, Sanaha, and Silks people. And also that in expressing this acknowledgement, also considering how we can authentically support our local indigenous peoples. So um, happy Earth Day. And before we launch into the topic of circular economy, I'd like to introduce Nadine Arneson. Um, she's a member of the Baha'i Faith representing the Nelson Interfaith Climate Action Collaborative. And she has a few words to say about Earth Day. So um, Radine, we look forward to um, hearing from you. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and happy Earth Day. Um, it's great to be here, and I'm really looking forward to this uh, discussion today about the circular economy. Um, one of the things I love about Earth Day is the celebratory feel it has to it. Um, it's quite fun to walk around saying happy Earth Day to people. And I think it's a great way to draw people in who might otherwise not want to think about climate change or, you know, it's something that draws people to it. Uh, if you remember the Earth Day parades that our climate um, at, um, interfaith group used to co-host with the Eco Society before the pandemic, they were such joyous, uplifting occasions. And again, it was just a way to draw new people in who may not have been involved with Earth Day before. So I like that aspect of it. Um, this is the 52nd anniversary of Earth Day, and as I'm sure you know, the theme this year is invest in our planet. And I learned from earthday.org that Earth Day is the largest civic observance in the world, with over a billion people from 192 countries participating in activities every year, and with more people joining every year. So that is a lot of unified action. And I'd like to share this from the earthday.org website. This is the moment to change it all, the business climate, the political climate, and how we take action on climate. Now is the time for the unstoppable courage to preserve and protect our health, our families, our livelihoods. Together, we must invest in our planet because a green future is a prosperous future. We need to act boldly, innovate broadly, and implement equitably. It's going to take all of us, all in, businesses, governments, and citizens, everyone accounted for, everyone accountable, a partnership for the planet. And while there is still time to solve the climate crisis, time to choose both a prosperous and sustainable future and time to restore nature and build a healthy planet for our children and their children. Time is short. And uh, speaking of children, today the Interface Climate Collaborative uh, is co-hosting with a youth group from the United Church called um, Spirit Explorers some Earth Day activities at Lakeside Park between 3.30 and 5. And uh, we're meeting in Duck Bay by the sign. Um, and naturalist and biologist Joanne Sidarius is going to tell some stories and give some information about the waterfowl and otters who live there. If you've walked through Lakeside Park lately, you'll notice there is no water in that bay. It's just a big mud flat and there's no waterfowl to be seen because the water's so low. But um, the sign has pictures of all the birds there, so she'll be able to refer to that. And then we're going to walk into the park and do some uh, Earth Day activities around the labyrinth area. So please feel free to join us. And um, Speaking of children, I would like to close with a short prayer for our children and grandchildren and all the children of the world for who it's, for who it's so important that we continue to work for our planet. 
O thou kind Lord, these lovely children are the handiwork of the fingers of thy might and the wondrous signs of thy greatness. O God, protect these children, graciously assist them to be educated and enable them to render service to the world of humanity. O God, these children are pearls, cause them to be nurtured within the shell of thy loving kindness. Thou art the bountiful, the all loving. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Brandine. That was lovely. And thank you for the interfaith, the Nelson Interfaith Group for hosting those lovely Earth Day uh, festivals um, and going online the last couple of years. And um, for everybody, um, hope you enjoy Earth Day in, in, in your own communities. I know that we're going to be tabling at Tagum Hall today as well. There's a big Earth Day fest there. And so, um, oh, and one other quick announcement before we get launching is that our next webinar, it's a bit earlier because of the May long weekend. So it's going to be Friday, May 13th. And we're going to be featuring uh, the Nest Lab and one of their offshoot initiatives of a new business uh, climate advisor position with the Nelson District Chamber of Commerce. So watch our newsletter for more. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Craig DeLong with, uh, with our hub partner, Kootenai Outdoor and Environmental Learning Society. And excited about your talk and the breakouts afterwards. So welcome, Craig, and I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks. <clears throat> okay. So I'll um, get going here, share my screen. Can everybody see that? Yes, it looks good. Um, okay. Not in full, yeah, is it in full screen yet or? Uh, um, uh, that's fine, it's good, yeah. Okay, so welcome all and glad, uh, thank you for showing up. So I'm gonna talk about closing the circular economy loop locally. Uh -oh. Why is it not moving? <clears throat> hmm. There we go. So the circular economy, I'm sure most of you have heard of it. It's an economic loop, closed loop in which raw materials, components and products lose their value as little as possible. Renewable energy sources are often used and systems thinking is often at the core. So what is systems thinking? It's a holistic approach to analysis that focuses on the way a system's constituent parts interrelate and how the systems work over time and within the context of larger systems. So that sounds a little complicated. So let's use an example. So, uh, Building design. So in the past, uh, building design was basically a roof over your head, some walls. It was meant to keep you dry and warm. But over time, we've taken climate into more consideration. So adjusting insulation and adjusting shading. Um, so it works more efficiently. Um, orientation towards the sun to take advantage of solar energy. Uh, even the biological systems, so as in green roofs. So a lot more thinking about the whole system surrounding that home and how to uh, work with those systems to make it the most efficient possible. So let's move on. The current status of the circular economy. Many large companies are incorpor incorporating the circular economy into their business which is great, but there are considerable supply chain implications. Very little uh, recycling from waste to product is done at or near the source. Consider your plastic that you put in your blue bin. Well, it could be on a journey to a dump. <laughs> Not all the plastics have recycled as uh, I'm sure you know, um, where it might turn into microplastics and then get into the water system, or it could end up in a uh, third world country, get burnt, getting burned up and creating all sorts of pollution and, and carbon footprint. But 
Definitely some of them, it will be made into products, but it goes on a long journey. And in some cases, crossing the ocean and back before it gets back to you as a recycled product. So, and a lot of impacts to air, soil and water and land are source associated with the supply chain. Um, so we wanna try to reduce that. Also, I'm just doing a little research and it turns out that uh, from a number of sources that su supply chain CO2 emissions are projected to increase, not decrease because of the complicated um, uh, supply chain that there is now. So what about closing the loop locally? It eliminates the supply chain CO2 emissions and stimulates the local economy. So now I'm gonna go into a couple of examples. Um, the one that I'm associated with um, and uh, that is a project under the Kootenai Outdoor and Environmental Learning Society is the Rossland Refactory. So what do we do? What are our goals? So one of the goals is to make products from local waste, primarily plastic with smaller machines. So it's focused on small businesses. Now, we never intended to recycle a whole bunch of plastic. Our intent was to build um, more businesses by first of all, improving the production efficiency and developing and testing new products. So we're doing kind of the grunt work. Um, and because we're a nonprofit, we don't need to make money. So we can afford to mess around with trying new products, trying new molds, um, wasting time doing this and that so we can get the uh, production really efficient. And then the intent is to provide courses and push this out there so that we can build more and more production uh, with small businesses locally that are doing this. So we'll, we're designing courses to help people uh, design uh, products, um, figure out the, the economics, build a business plan, and to eventually make recycled products. Some of these uh, businesses could be started up for under $10,000. So it's a business that could be easily started up to use more and more of this plastic uh, locally. Um, so currently we're using uh, an injection machine that you can see in the middle that essentially you push plastic into a mold. It's as simple as that. It heats up the plastic and you push it into a mold. So currently we're taking number two plastics uh, like milk jugs and, and other number two plastic and we're turning it into house numbers of different colors. And we're actually now trying to put a little flair to it. So it really is a unique product by mixing in a little bit of other colors. So you get a bit of a blend and some streaks of other colors. So we're turning out a really unique product that kind of has its made in Rosslyn or made in the Kootenai stamp. And that's what we hope others will do. We're also turning CD cases, which are often recycled and we're turning CD cases into ski scrapers. Now we have another uh, machine, an extrusion machine that we're just uh, um, uh, building right now. And it actually pushes the plastic into molds. So you can use much bigger molds. Um, so we can make uh, building blocks, sort of Lego style building blocks that can be used for walls, built uh, structures um, and also things like park benches. So there's been a lot of collaboration. Um, and one of the ones I wanna point out that has been a real help is the Precious Plastic Community. It's a worldwide community where people um, have been making machines, improving these small machines that are used for a local recycling uh, project. Um, 
it's a very um, cool community where there's total information sharing. Uh, there's th places in the third world countries where they're taking the plastic out of the gutter and cleaning it and, and, and making stuff. It's truly inspiring and total information sharing. In fact, to become a full-fledged member, you must uh, create a video and create instructions on how to make uh, something out of, out of uh, recycled plastic. Um, so it's, it's, it, it's incredible what, they're, what the whole community is doing. Um, so we're part of that. Uh, locally, the Selkirk Technology Access Center um, that's in Glen Mary near Trail, um, they are producing our molds for us. They have a machine that can create very nice clean edged molds and they provide that, that to us um, so that we can make our house numbers, et cetera. Casey Recycling um, out of Winita near Trail, um, they uh, run a battery recycling operation and we're using a bit of their space um, to operate out of. Um, and then City of Rossland has helped us with a little bit of funding. Uh, local businesses and community members have really chipped in um, you know, with gift certificates and also they're feeding us plastic. Uh, the local coffee shop, they give us probably three or four of those big uh, litter collection bags full of, full of milk jugs uh, that we can shred and, and turn into product. Um, other local businesses like the, the bike shop, they have all sorts of stuff that comes in plastic. They don't like the thought of just throwing it in a regular stream. So they're providing all that plastic to us. Um, so that's great, a lot of input from the community. Um, we're also on the process with another group uh, developing a makerspace. So that's another aspect. Um, and also we got uh, some funding from the BC government, Clean BC Plastics Action Fund. This is the first fund that's actually gone towards uh, getting more plastics recycling. So that's great. So there's uh, some other facilities, local facilities um, that are doing this. The, the Rogery in Kelowna turns plastic waste into 3D printed household products. And one of the cool things there is they're actually got an agreement with the local dump and they're actually taking, getting, cutting the guts out of, out of refrigerators which are just in the dump, uh, rotting away, or probably not rotting away, <laughs> sitting there for a long time. And they take that plastic from those fridges and they turn it into products. So it's pretty cool. You should check them out when you're a Kelowna. They don't ship because that's their deal. They want to reduce that uh, supply chain, but you um, can buy product there. Ericsson Recycling uh, makes small items out of local plastics uh, in Creston. And those are the ones I'm aware of. Um, there may be others. So now I wanna turn our attention to a low waste food production facilities. So these are closed loop systems where resources are conserved and max production is maximized through control of light, temperature and nutrients. <clears throat> so there's low energy consumption and Obviously they can augment local food supply because they have a greenhouse associated with them so they can be growing stuff all year round. They're also growing um, protein as you'll find out that not, it's not beef, it's not pork. <laughs> it's like salmon that, that's not locally available. Um, and also there's a potential to address supply chain and food security because these could be located, um, you know, somewhere locally throughout uh, the Kootenays, say, for example. So one of them is Habitat. It's located near Chase, BC. It's using a recirculating aquaponic system to grow salmon, cannabis, and vegetables with 99% of the water conserved. Uh, microbes are used to digest the detritus from the fish tanks, and that's converted to a liquid fertilizer, which is fed to the plants. 
And then the plants are grown hydroponically with high production compared to soil grown. And of course, all the evaporation that happens off those plants is condensed and then it's back into the water system. So they, they can conserve the water. There's also tricycle, not local, but uh, this was kind of cool. They're based in Montreal. Um, it's vertical farming of crickets and vegetables. So they use the detritus from the crickets uh, as nutrients for, for, for growing vegetables. So again, it's this idea of growing up of animal-based protein, but using the detritus uh, from that to fertilize the plants in a, in a closed loose loop system. So lastly, I want to talk about repair. So repair, you're not even entering the circular economy. You're actually fixing it. <laughs> and there's a lot of interest in that. And it's been a growing thing around uh, the planet. Uh, repair Cafe is one of the big ones. So it's a community hub where local residents can bring in broken items and get them repaired for free, as well as network, learn skills, socialize, and help others. And this is another growing community around the planet. There's over a thousand centers worldwide with hundreds in Belgium, Germany, and the Netherlands. I must point out that the Netherlands is actually where the precious plastic community started out as well. So the Netherlands are obviously really ahead of the game in, in this sort of thing. And there's 15 that are listed in Canada. Um, none in the Columbia Basin that I could find. There may be something similar that I don't know about, um, but the closest one I could find was in Kamloops. And then there's uh, another um, uh, bunch down in the lower mainland. So something we can start up here in the Kootenays. Now repair a cafe. So the way forward, collaboration, collaboration is the key. Cities, regional districts, businesses, nonprofits, innovation centers, we all got to be working together. This is such a critical thing. Climate change, climate impacts, plastics, it, it's just so important that we need to be working as a team collaboratively to get as much done, to get uh, you know, as much plastic recycled, to, to deal with supply chain issues, all these things um, within the Kootenays. Information sh sharing. Patents are passe. No patents, continuous improvement. It's too important for people to be holding information that, that could be shared. Obviously, we just uh, have seen that with the, the global pandemic, uh, COVID, uh, when, when, when industry, when they started working together, they got achieved a lot more in a shorter period of time. This is the kind of thing we need um, to, to move quickly. Um, decentralization, we, we've gone the route of centralization, it hasn't worked. We need to decentralize. We need many small businesses uh, doing the work in a smaller area so that we can get a, rid of these uh, supply chain implication. So along with that becomes the scaling of technology and processes. A lot of the technology and processes were designed for big industry. So big machines, et cetera. We need to scale those down and think about, get the engineers, get everybody involved in scaling down that technology uh, like they've done with precious plastic. Um, and so these uh, same things can be done in smaller operations um, in, in smaller uh, communities. Changing purchasing habitats, habits, <laughs> habit. We're, we've gone along somewhat 
uh, in, in ways I thought. And then, then, you know, Amazon came along and man, it's so easy. Just go in and push that button. Oh, I've ordered it. It's going to be here in two days. Wow. And, you know, we've got to, we got to make sure we're buying locally. And in that sense, I think we can develop Amazon of the Kootenays. We develop a website that features products made in the West Kootenays with online ordering. All these small businesses are on the website. You just go on the website, you click in what you want. Boom, oh, that's made in Caswell. Cool, I can order it. And then we can make use of all personal vehicles driving from city to city in the area using website and app to link drivers with business owners. It's like the ride share only for product. We can reduce supply chain. If a person is driving from one community to another, they're already doing that. Their carbon footprint is already happening. So why not have them deliver a package from Caslow to, to Rossland so I can get my whatever I ordered from Caslow in a couple of days, you know, it may not be as fast as Amazon, but you'll get it in a few days and, and you've uh, done away with supply chain. There's all sorts of innovation that we can do. And I think we can do a lot in the Kootenays by banding together and just getting stuff done. So that's it for my presentation. If you want to help, you can contact me at coolsociety at gmail.com or contact the West Kootenai Climate Hub and they'll connect you with me. So that's the end of the presentation. And now we're gonna uh, have some breakout rooms so we can uh, get into this a little more. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, um, Craig. That's very exciting. I love the ideas and visions that you shared. Oh, you can stop sharing screen as well. As you oh, want. great. And so I'll, I'll let folks know what the, um, the, the next plan is. So um, we have breakout rooms and when I, um, well, let me see, I can go ahead and I have them set up here. I, uh, I'll just explain them first. Uh, so there'll be uh, three topics that we can delve deeper into. So there's repair, the closed loop food production systems and waste recycling. And so um, I'm going to launch those in just a minute. Hopefully they're still active. If not, I'll have to recreate them. Um, so then just go and click on whatever breakout room you want to go to. And that will be at the bottom of your screen in just a minute. And you should see a, a join button. And if you prefer, you could also jump around. And we have a, a few questions for the breakout rooms to consider. And I'll put these in chat in a second as well. Or maybe I'll put them in there before we get the breakouts going. Um, the questions then are, what are the main barriers to establishing local facilities and what are some corresponding solutions? Um, what are some potential funding sources and how do we achieve collaboration throughout? And we originally had it as the West Kootenai, but I'd like to broaden that to the Kootenays since we um, have folks joining from the East Kootenai as well. Um, so it could be either or. And we'll also have a jam board for each group and so let me go ahead and put this in chat, um, the questions. There you go. And breakout rooms are still there. So I'm gonna open the rooms now and you should be able to move to them again at the bottom where it says breakout rooms. And if it doesn't show up, you might need to click on more with the three dots there. And then when you click on that, you should be able to see uh, your ability to join. So is that coming up for folks? Okay, yeah, they're at the bottom. You have to scroll down. Okay, I see a couple people may have figured it out. Hopefully, uh, yeah, I think folks are starting to figure it out. Okay, I'll be here to move people if you want, if you're having um, difficulty. Oh, and I'm going to stop recording now. We're not going to record the breakout rooms. So, um, one minute there too. I'm gonna to just pause. So I'd love to hear uh, how that went. Any ideas on any of those, you know, the topics of um, barriers and solutions or funding or uh, 
like better ways to stay connected and collaborate? Um, I can't remember who made our Jamboard. Should we share a ja the Jamboard or should we just That's discuss a good idea. Something? Sure, you know, you could share the Jamboard if you want to, or you could just discuss or if somebody, yeah. Okay, there's our Jamboard. <laughs> So we got a fair amount done on paper. Um, so can everybody see that? Well, could you say what your breakout room was? Oh, yeah, it, it was ra waste recycling. It's up at the top there. Oh, OK, yep. Um, so some of the barriers were getting local participation. Uh, people are really busy these days and to try to get them out there, especially as volunteers, it's been tough. So I think it's just making them more aware of, of what their time is getting them. In other words, they're helping with the solution. And so we, we've tried to do that. And, and over time, you know, we've gotten a little more participation uh, in, in with the uh, in this case the Ross and refactory, um, getting local buy-in um, was another one. Um, so you know you want to engage directly with local businesses um, to help capture their waste stream. Like in Ross and I was saying we we worked with the Alpine Grind. They give us a ton of milk jugs um, that normally would have gone through the normal recycling. Um, um, so energy emissions. Oh, yeah, you know, there's, this is more um, like there's a lot of, uh, of information out there, but it's sometimes not shared. For instance, there's a company down in the States that, that has figured out a way to just press the plastic with with uh, pressure into blocks with without uh, heat and but they patented it and you know you know it's just I wish that when people come out with an innovation that it was shared like like happens on the precious plastic um, uh, community um, it, you know we're wasting time and and this should be shared so we're going to work to to develop this uh, with a local entrepreneur, hopefully, um, so we can share that uh, just using pressure. And this will take all sorts of plastics. We have a problem right now with number one plastics because the temperature between uh, melting and burning is quite tight. And so there's a whole idea about patents and open source. Um, yeah, this is great. Um, any specifics on any of the other topics and then um, we'll, we'll we can share these jam boards with folks afterwards if you wanted to yeah so what is it, does somebody else have a jam board to share or some other ideas from the other sessions well you can uh, yeah okay i was I'm not wanting to cut you off but i just want no, to no, I, of time that we've got five yeah minutes. we can share them later so okay um how about the um repair group do you have any uh, ideas or things that came up that were unique? Maybe just sort of focusing on a couple of a couple of things that were really uh, spoke to you. Um, yeah, I can uh, share. Sorry, I just lost it. I can share a Jamboard. Can you see that? Yes. Yep. Okay. Good. Um, yeah, so some of the main barriers we talked about was like, where are we gonna put it? Like find just finding a location itself is a barrier and then um, ensuring the place and uh, kind of getting all of those logistics sorted out. Um, and then, you know, what about things that can't be fixed? Like so many of the products that we buy now are intentionally made to make it very difficult for you to try to fix them because they want you to purchase more products, right? And Craig kind of spoke about that earlier too, mm -hmm. about, um, you know, part of the, one of the barriers is gonna be just changing consumer behavior as well. Um, yeah, we talked a bit about right to repair legislation and uh, a few other things. Um, we were most we mostly talked about opportunities though we were all very excited about, about this idea so i definitely think there's more opportunity than there are barriers for this but 
uh, and feel free anyone else in our room to chime in if there's anything you want to add. Um, lots of potential funding sources um, to explore, um, everything from like private donations and fundraising um, to like corporate sponsorship, grants, um, municipal funding perhaps. Um, and also just what can we learn from other places that are already doing this, like the Repair Cafe in Kamloops, uh, apparently Caslo has some form of a tool library. I didn't know that. That's really exciting. Um, where did they get their funding? You know, there, I think there are other groups that we can talk to to explore other ideas. Um, and we just barely touched on the collaboration piece, but, you know, getting the word out, social media, having some sort of virtual town hall, perhaps, to kind of put the word out and educate uh, citizens that this opportunity is available and here's how you can access it and that sort of thing. And then just starting small, I think was the last point that we ended on. Um, the importance of just starting small and seeing where it goes. Um, I'm scanning the virtual room, Stephen. Does anyone have anything to add about no, what we was, talked about? great. Okay. Look good. Yeah, awesome. it was a great discussion. Yeah, wonderful. And I see a note here in the chat uh, that Ross Linden uh, has a tool library and Trail has a toy library, which is really awesome. awesome. Somebody has a toy library in, in Nelson, I believe. Nelson has a toy library yeah. as well. Yeah. It's Kootenai Kids that Kootenai Kids does that. Okay. the toy library. It's amazing. And I don't know, just our library in general here in Nelson is doing some pretty amazing things. You can get puzzles now. For all you puzzle people who don't want to plunk down $20, $30 every time to do it once and then lose your joy, but that's not a repair thing, so I'll stop. <laughs> but it gets that's it awesome. used more than one time. So yeah, the library. Yeah. Oh. Makes so much sense, you know, and kids don't really need that much toys and they actually get kind of tired of them after a couple, you know, week or two. Um, so I will just speak really briefly uh, for a minute about the um, closed loop food um, breakout. Uh, we had a lot of discussion about um, farming in general, I guess, and how challenging farming is. And then um, there was some discussions as well about, like, I don't, I don't know if anybody's actually using one of these food system, this concept, like you were talking about, Craig, locally. But um, I was talking to my electrician. He was over here last week, and he was talking about wanting to start something like this in Glade. And so I'm just wondering if I happen to hear that, how many other people are thinking about doing this as well in some small scale and how we can have learnings that can um, happen. And um, as Andre was saying, sort of, you know, organically, you know, connecting rather than a big top down kind of initiative is kind of where it comes from and in communities. And, and so I didn't get to capture that entire conversation and I apologize. If anybody wants to add anything in like 30 seconds before we have to close, then that group would be great. Otherwise, let's keep this conversation going. I really think this is an important uh, conversation that can provide real world on the ground, you know, ideas of concrete things that can be done. And I think that excites people and gets them more interested in doing more things. So um, yeah. Hopefully, uh, this will be the beginning of the conversation. And so thank you, everybody, for attending just, and your um, time. Uh, interject really quickly on the conversation? Just uh, We wanted to fit this in. Um, oh, yeah. I'm just, I'm just dropping something in the chat. Uh, my partner, Mark, and I work with the LCIC and Metal Tech Alley. Um, mm -hmm. We're currently working to model our local economy supply chain. Um, so I'm going to just drop this message into, a ch into the chat here. And it's got our email contact if anybody would like to get in touch. Great, can you can you explain a little bit more about what you mean? And folks that do have to drop off, I understand it's the top of the hour, but um, uh, yeah, like a little 20 seconds. And Kaylin, thank you very much for your help. Yeah, so we're just, we're a GIS company actually. Uh, so we work with spatial data and analysis and we're, we are just kind of gathering information to model the local supply chain. Uh, it's essentially a visualization project. And does that include food as well? Uh, one of the objectives is to span essentially all industries. Awesome. Uh, so we're trying to we're trying to address that issue of silos. Uh, between Excellent. Businesses and industries. I would love to uh, if you could follow up when that project gets um, uh, closer to completion. I think that um, would love to amplify that and see how. Yeah, and it. 
and in fact, I'm I'm thinking uh, Cool has already had one forum on transportation. I'm I'm thinking that we may have another forum on this exact thing. Uh, I have some ideas on that, so maybe you can reach out and get you guys involved and see what we can make uh, develop a forum. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording and folks are uh, welcome to hang out and chat a little bit longer, but um, thank you again, everybody for attending and happy Earth Day. Thank you.